Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters, I'm Sister B and welcome to another episode with Islamic Audio Bites. Some of you may have heard the announcement a couple of weeks back that Islamic Legacy have given us permission to play their audio on our podcast and we will be starting with the Crusades through Muslim eyes. We are extremely thankful to Islamic Legacy for allowing us to do this and I recommend checking out their website, islamiclegacy.org, and looking through the various projects that they have done. So the format going forward will be a couple of episodes from the audio from Islamic Legacy and a couple of episodes then from the book that we are reading, which currently is Stories of the Prophets. So you've probably had enough of my voice. Let's crack on with listening to the Crusades through Muslim eyes. Let's listen. Chapter 1. Jerusalem Burns Of the many stories that we hear in our lives, there are some that truly stay with us, even if at first we don't quite understand why. These are stories full of darkness and dread of deeds so horrific that one wonders how the Muslim Ummah can possibly emerge from the shadow of such evil times. And yet the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be upon him, endures. Indeed, it thrives. New generations replace older ones. A people arise that are empowered by belief in Allah and courage and determination to change their situation for the better. This is one of those stories. And it all began in Jerusalem in the year 1099. 11th century Jerusalem was a thriving city of Islamic learning. Scholars from all over the world lived around such holy sites as the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Although Jerusalem has always been inhabited by Muslims, Christians, and Jews, it was over 400 years ago when the Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab, traveled personally to Jerusalem to sign the Treaty of Ilya al-Quds and was given the keys to the city by the Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem lay at the heart of a vast Muslim empire, surrounded by nation-states such as Damascus, Aleppo, Mosul, Baghdad, and Cairo. It contained a sizable population since it housed refugees from other towns and villages who had sought asylum behind its walls. But for Jerusalem, 1099 would be a year like no other. From thousands of miles away, a marauding nation dressed in chainmail armor with blood-colored crosses painted across their chests marched into the city and put it to the sword. These were the Franks, and they were motivated by their faith in Christianity. They believed they were on a holy mission commanded and led by God himself, for which they would have all their sins forgiven and paradise guaranteed. This was an audacious mission indeed, for on the one hand, Crusader knights were pouring into the Muslim states of Spain, Calabria, Corsica, and Sicily. But to attack the Muslim Saracen in his own homeland, that had never been attempted before. The abbot Raymond of Aguilés wrote with glee, When our men took the main defenses, we saw some astonishing things amongst the Saracens. Some were beheaded, and that's the least that could happen to them. Others were pierced through, and so threw themselves from the heights of the walls. Others, having suffered in length, were thrown into the flames. We could see in the roads, in the places of Jerusalem, bits and pieces of heads, hands, and feet. Everywhere, we could only walk through cadavers. But all that was only little. There was so much blood in the old temple of Solomon that dead corpses swam in it. We could see hands floating, and arms that went to glue themselves to bodies that were not theirs. We could not distinguish which arm belonged to which body. The men who were doing the killing could hardly bear the smoke 
from the corpses. For seven days, riot and carnage continued. John William Draper, a 19th century historian, writes, In the capture by the Crusaders, the brains of young children were dashed out against the walls. Infants were thrown over the battlements. Every woman that could be seized was violated. Men were roasted at fires. Some were ripped open to see if they had swallowed gold. The Jews were driven into their synagogue and there burnt. A massacre of nearly 70,000 persons took place and the Pope's legate was seen partaking in the triumph. Of all the learned men and scholars that came to Jerusalem from the Muslim world, none escaped with their lives. Al-Rumeli, the most celebrated Palestinian muhadith of his age, was stoned to death. Such was the carnage when Fulcher, the Christian chronicler, visited Jerusalem in 1099, five months after its capture. He was disgusted by the stench of death inside and outside the city walls. To complete their deeds, the Crusaders desecrated the Al-Aqsa Mosque, pigs were installed in the Mihrab, and a church was erected in place of one of its oratories. Unlike the conquering Muslims of the past, these holy warriors raped Jerusalem with a savage bloodlust. But the Muslim does not find satisfaction in blaming others for his own misfortune. Responsibility for the safety and security of the Muslim people lies solely with themselves. Instead, the Muslim must ask himself, how could an invading force march halfway across the world and into the heart of Muslim lands, while the armies of Damascus, Aleppo, Mosul, Baghdad, and Cairo were still standing? But the story of the Crusades must begin with the Crusaders themselves. The reason why the knights of the Frankish nation decided to leave their families and their homes to march thousands of miles to a land they had never seen but only heard about in myth and legend. Chapter 2. Knights from a Dark Age The year is 1095, four years prior to the massacre in Jerusalem. Western Europe is in its darkest age. Life is miserable for the common man who slaves away on the land in service of the lords. He is condemned to living in smelly rags, his hair long and matted, filled with lice, his face scarred by pox, and his body covered with grime. Home is a one-room hovel constructed of wood or sod with earthen floors, no windows, and a simple hole in the roof for smoke to pass. Food is moldy bread and on occasion, rancid pork from a garbage-eating pig that might roam the streets. Life, death, and all bodily functions are open for all to see. Not many survive birth to experience life, and fewer survive life to die of old age. Europe lived by a feudal system where the lowest class of citizen was the common man tied to the land. Above the commoner were the barons or lords that owned the land, the source of all wealth. The most powerful lord of all was the king. An intricate system of loyalty between lords and kings maintained the balance of power in the land. But even with a ruling king, law and order was not centralized. It was up to the lords to protect their land against other lords and wandering barbarians. To fill this need, Lords and barons employed a warrior class known as the knights to fight in their armies, guard their castles, act as messengers or ambassadors, and serve on councils. They were trained from an early age to wield the sword, lance, and shield, and to ride on horseback wearing heavy armor wrought from iron. The knight was under his lord's protection, both legally and militarily. Whenever there was a battle, and frequently lords were at war with each other, he would combine with other knights to form a formidable fighting force. During the Dark Ages, violence was the norm. Lords fought each other for land and wealth incessantly, while barbarians, brigands, and thieves were a constant threat. The smell of death was everywhere. Needless to say, 
this part of the world could be a violent and miserable place to live. In medieval society, the people looked to the church for their own personal salvation. God and paradise could only be reached through the church's representatives. To be excommunicated from the church was considered the worst possible disaster for the individual, for it supposedly condemned them to hell on earth and in the hereafter. This made the institution of the church more powerful than any king and also very rich. On top of the various taxes and fees it imposed on the people, it also offered indulgences. An indulgence was a partial or full exemption from some or all of the hard time awaiting Christians in the next life because they have sinned. Indulgences were offered by the church in exchange for donations, but also for other acts of service to the church. Towards the end of the 11th century, the church was in a state of crisis. The institution had split into two over the issue of marriage within the clergy. The gulf between the western half and the orthodox eastern half was widening. Further, the right to appoint the pope became an issue of contention between the church and the state. In fact, the situation was so grave that at one time there were three different popes. At the same time, the ongoing war between Muslims and Christians in Spain and North Africa had taken a turn for the better. News of a number of Christian victories was filtering in. The ruler of the Byzantine Empire and the protector of the Eastern Church sent a message seeking help after a series of defeats to the Muslim Seljuk Turks. An opportunity presented itself. Pope Urban decided that it was time to pursue the Muslim Saracens in their own homeland. He would demonize the Muslims with untruths, and he would call upon the Christians to rid the infidels from the Holy Lands. In Clermont, France, 1095, he addressed thousands of noblemen, knights, and commoners, calling upon them to take arms against the demonic Saracen foe. From the confines of Jerusalem and the city of Constantinople, a horrible tale has gone forth and very frequently has been brought to our ears, namely, that a race from the kingdom of the Persians, an accursed race, has invaded the lands of those Christians and has depopulated them by the sword, pillage, and fire. When they wish to torture people by a base death, they perforate their navels and what shall I say of the abominable rape of the women? To speak of it is worse than to be silent. Oh, what a disgrace if such a despised and base race which worships demons should conquer a people which has the faith of omnipotent God and is made glorious with the name of Christ. The incentives were great for the Crusaders. They would be given full indulgences. The riches of the East would be at their feet and a chance to escape the wretched conditions they lived in to the land of milk and honey. The message was relayed to every village in Europe. Princes, lords, knights, priests, peasants, women and children responded in droves. Their aim was to annihilate Muslim existence in the East. Wearing the Crusader cross and shouting, God wills it, they marched toward Jerusalem, blinded by their newfound religious zeal. Chapter 3. Clash of the Titans Scarcely a year had passed following Pope Urban's speech when the news of the arrival of a very large Christian army began to trickle in. They were approaching from the Sea of Marmara, near modern-day Turkey, and were headed for the lands of a Turkish sultan named Kilij Arslan. Not yet 17 years old, this slanty-eyed Turk prepared for the worst. He cast an intricate web of scouts and spies to report on the movements of this new Frankish enemy. 
but his intelligence reports were painting a strange picture. Although this army numbered several thousand, the majority were women, children, and old people dressed in rags. Only several hundred knights accompanied by foot soldiers posed any real danger. But Khalij Arslan took no chances. He conceived a plan to divide and conquer the invaders. First, he would trap a party from the Frankish army in a local fortress with no access to water. To save their comrades, the remaining part would be lured into the open. There, his horse archers would be devastating. The plan was a resounding success. The Christian army was decimated, and Khalij Arslan hardly suffered any losses of his own. So intoxicated was the Turkish emir by his own success that when the Franks returned the following year in greater numbers, he refused to be distracted from fighting his traditional enemy, another Turkish emir named Danishmend. It wasn't until the Crusaders reached the capital city of his empire that the picture became horribly clear. The new force was not a band of tattered villagers, but thousands of heavily equipped knights accompanied by Byzantine soldiers of the Greek emperor Alexius Komnenos. What was to be done now? After days of intense talks with his most trusted emirs, Khalij Arslan approached Danishmend. Unlike most of the other Turkish leaders who were illiterate, Danishmend was reputed to have been extremely knowledgeable and well-versed in the various branches of learning. Hence his title, Danishmend the Wise. It must have been tempting for Danishmend to leave his sworn enemy to face the Crusaders on his own, but in a move that was truly extraordinary for that time, he agreed to make a public declaration of jihad, calling all Turks to unite against the invasion army. Thus began the first crucial battle between the Muslims and the Crusaders. Having taken Nicaea, the Crusaders continued further south into the heart of the Turkish Empire. Khalij Arslan began to shadow the Crusader army. His scouts reported that they were heading toward the city of Dorylium. The Sultan knew this section of the road narrowed as it wove its way through a shallow valley. This was the perfect site for an ambush. The Muslims hid behind the hills, occupying the high ground with the sun behind them two key advantages that would leverage the battle in their favor. They were ready to pounce on their prey. The sun had barely risen from behind the hills when the order to attack was given. The tactics of the Turkish warriors were well practiced. After all, they had assured their military supremacy in the Orient for a half a century. Their army was composed almost exclusively of lightweight horses mounted by expert archers. They would draw near the enemy, unleash a flood of deadly arrows, and then retreat briskly, giving way to a new row of attackers. A few successive waves usually sufficed to bring their prey to their death agony. Only then would they unsheathe their swords and pursue their enemy on foot. But there was something different about this battle. The young sultan watched anxiously from his observation post as he noted that the tried-and-true Turkish methods lacked their usual effectiveness. Even though the crusaders were slow and clumsy compared to his cavalry, they wore very heavy armor that covered their entire bodies and sometimes those of their horses as well. This armor protected them from the hail of arrows that would have annihilated any other enemy. The knights stuck together and on occasion they would charge into the midst of the Muslims with terrific momentum, and when they charged, none could stand in their way. After several hours of battle, the Turkish archers had inflicted many casualties, especially among the foot soldiers, but the bulk of the Frankish army remained intact. Should they engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat? Khalij Arslan was unsure. That seemed risky. During the many skirmishes around the field of battle, the Turkish horsemen had difficulty holding their own against these virtual human fortresses. Should the phase of harassment be prolonged indefinitely? Now that the element of surprise had worn off, the initiative might shift to the other side. Some of the emirs were already counseling retreat when a cloud of dust appeared in the distance. A fresh Frankish army was approaching, as numerous as the first. The Turks had only been fighting the forward guard of a much larger army. Now the Sultan had no choice but to order a retreat. 
Before he could do so, a third Frankish army came into view behind the Turkish lines on a hill overlooking the tent of the general staff. Now Kilij Arslan succumbed to fear. He leapt onto his charger and headed for the mountains at full gallop, even abandoning the rich treasure he had brought to pay his troops. Donishment was not far behind, along with most of the emirs. Taking advantage of their speed, many horsemen managed to get away without the victors being able to give chase, but most of the Muslim soldiers remained where they were, surrounded on all sides. As Ibn al-Kalanisi wrote, the Frange cut the Turkish army to pieces. They killed, pillaged, and took many prisoners who were sold into slavery. Kilij Arslan was both stunned and humiliated. He had underestimated the power of the Frankish knight, and even worse, the size of the enemy. It appeared as if Europe had emptied itself of all its fighters. But what was the purpose of this invasion? What was their ultimate destination? News of the Turkish debacle began to spread throughout Muslim lands. In the words of a Syrian chronicler, when this event so shameful for Islam became known, there was real panic. Dread and anxiety welled to enormous proportions. Fear had struck the hearts of the Muslims, and it was well justified, for the Crusaders were about to unleash a horror beyond anything they could ever conceive, and the Muslim Ummah was not prepared to resist the intensity of their aggression. The Khalifa resided not too far in Baghdad, but he was no more than a symbolic figure. His power and authority did not extend much farther than the compounds of his palace, where he spent most of his ample time supervising feats of architecture and composing romantic poems. At the time, there were two main Muslim powers in conflict with each other, one Sunni, the other Shiite. The Sunni Seljuk Turks had served a crushing defeat on the Byzantine Christian Empire and had taken control of most of the Middle East. That is it for today. I hope you found that beneficial and please do tune in to the next episode. Please remember to leave a review and rating wherever you listen and to remember to share the podcast with your family and friends. We are on all the major podcasting platforms including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher and we're also on YouTube as a voice only channel. Please join our Islamic Audio Bytes community on Instagram and Twitter and follow me on Facebook as well. Do check out our website at islamicaudiobytes.com and if you would like to contact me directly, please do so at sisterb007 at gmail.com. Hope your day is full of goodness. Aslamu alaikum.